So hello everybody, welcome um, the ASAP Bio Preprints in the Public Eye Challenges and Solutions in the Age of Misinformation event. We've got a really packed program of talks coming up for you during the next hour. Um, our first two speakers are going to talk about the, the problem of research misinformation and miscommunication in the context of COVID-19 and preprints. And then there will be a series of lightning talks from representatives from the worlds of publishing, academia, preprint servers, um, and journalism. who will give their perspectives on the problem and um, suggest solutions on how, how, how misinformation um, and the problem can be um, addressed. And we're going to fit in some time for questions at the end. So if you do have questions, do drop them into the chat um, and we'll try and cover as many as possible um, after the lightning talks. Just, just trying to forward slides. Okay, here we are. Just a reminder of um, our community rules. Um, keep your um, mics muted. You might want to switch off your videos as well, um, unless um, you're a speaker, so that you don't distract um, the present presenters. Um, and as always, be professional and be respectful. So with that, we're going to dive straight in and I'm going to hand over to our first speaker, Ivan, to introduce himself um, and, and take the meeting forward. Over to you, Ivan. Great, thanks very much, Shigisha, and thanks so much to ASAP Bio for organizing this. I'm gonna be, uh, I'm gonna try and be quite brief. In fact, I guess I'm going to um, do my talk maybe even at a dangerous speed since that's the title, uh, I think. Um, I know I see a lot of familiar names, uh, obviously among the panelists, as well as among those of you I've seen checking in here. So uh, I will briefly say I'm co-founder of Retraction Watch, uh, Editor-in-Chief of Spectrum, and I teach journalism uh, at NYU. I'm also the president of the Association of Healthcare Journalists. Those all seem at least somewhat relevant to what I'm gonna talk about today, which is again, covering signs and dangerous speeds, really from a journalist point of view, uh, and trying to put you in a little, give you a little bit of a sense of some of the questions we're grappling with. Um, if I could have the next slide. Um, what is, once a marathon has become compressed to 400 meter dash. So in other words, here we are again, obviously now, uh, maybe in retrospect, we've actually accomplished a bit of the 400 meter dash, depending on how you look at it. Again, that's probably a rosy colored picture, but journalists have to cover again, uh, this really, this rapid race um, and have to uh, sort of try and be uh, up to date and break news and obviously also accurate, um, that's, a, that's a very tough challenge. And it's one that um, has not frankly been made easier by the, uh, the, the sort of extreme, not just speed, but the sort of cacophony, if you will, the, um, the, the wonderful plurality of, excuse me, plurality of voices, but one that has made it difficult it's it often and probably every day to figure out what's really going on. If I could have the next slide. What I'd like to do now is uh, work through, uh, sort of show you a number of examples because given the, the subject today in terms of preprints and in terms of uh, covering science at a at dangerous speed, a number of uh, cases of papers that were covered uh, one way or another and that turned out in fact to be, uh, to be incorrect. Uh, I wanna be very clear that uh, it isn't just uh, it isn't just preprints, of course, that we're, which we're talking about today, that is speeding up. But in fact, peer review has sped up uh, quite dramatically. This was a paper again that came out in June. There's been at least one other that I've seen that have that has made similar findings. Um, median time from receipt to acceptance of six days for journal articles. Again, it's not that it's impossible to to pass, you know to do a good peer review in six days, but it's obviously, you know, you, you don't have as much, I guess the jury's out on whether or not that leads to more mistakes, but we've certainly seen a good number. Speaking of which, so this was a, uh, actually something that happened very early. I mean, back in February, which is, you know, coming up on a year ago now, which I'm sure feels like 20 years for many of us. Um, this was actually a retraction, a withdrawal of a preprint uh, within 48 hours. And um, Adam and I uh, sort of noticed that there were lots of discussion on Twitter and elsewhere. I won't get into too much detail given time, but what we sort of are, are what we weighed in here at Stat, at Stat News in our column there and said, look, you know, this is actually a good moment. This means that in response to a lot of uh, criticism and a lot of critique, 
the paper was withdrawn literally within 48 hours on a Sunday afternoon. Um, and that has been uh, sort of, that's happened sometimes during the pandemic and other times things have taken quite a while and some things are still ongoing. Um, but because people tend to be very concerned, uh, there've been a lot of uh, people, journalists and others writing about the sort of risks of preprints. But in fact, we would argue at, at Retraction Watch anyway, that, and, and looking at this as a journalist, that there are just as many issues, if not more, in the peer reviewed literature, which we're supposed to sort of treat with more uh, I don't know what, but sort of gravitas and sort of think has, has been vetted. It's been vetted, but not all that well in many cases. So again, here was another case where a lot of you probably recall the Imperial College report. They ended up, they were citing a withdrawn preprint uh, for one of the major sort of background, some of the major backgrounds in their paper. Um, they ended up having to correct it. And again, this was in Lancet Infectious Diseases. This was not uh, a preprint itself. Um, a lot of you saw early on the New England Journal of Medicine about remdesivir, a uh, paper about remdesivir, only 53 patients, um, not blinded, not even actually controlled. And yet, and this was really, frankly, below the standards of a major medical journal like New England Journal uh, for, for centuries, uh, decades at least. Um, and yet this was a, again, not a preprint that was sort of rushed into press, but a paper, and this was a criticism of it. You all, of course, remember Surgisphere and um, the two major, there were a number of attractions related to Surgisphere, but the two major ones, again, that was the Lancet New England Journal of Medicine. Uh, the Lancet one in particular got a huge amount of attention because it involved hydroxychloroquine. Um, again, these were not preprints, they were peer reviewed papers. And so this notion that somehow if it's peer reviewed, if it's in one of the big journals, that must be you know, sort of something we should definitely pay attention to I really think we have to at least question that um, and at least think about it. Uh, we've been keeping a list at Retraction Watch of the number of retracted papers about COVID-19. Uh, as of this morning, it's 74. It's been 74 for about a week now, I think. Um, I want to just note, then you can go to the site and, and it's on there. We update it whenever we uh, can. I want to note a couple of things. One is that uh, about a quarter of those, 18 of them right now, are from preprint servers, whether it's BioArchive, MedArchive, um, and SSRN, uh, but most of them are not. Most of them are, for, are from uh, peer -reviewed, uh, the peer-reviewed literature, published papers, um, and 10 of them are actually because publishers published the same pa paper twice, uh, no fault of the authors. So everyone's rushing, including publishers. And so again, this notion that the quality control is happening at the journals and yet not at preprint servers, I think is one that we at least have to, to really think about. Um, again, Adam and I had a, did a column uh, early on, um, and uh, we tried to be a little bit clever here, maybe too clever, uh, saying, in other words, let's all stay six studies away. And one of my messages for years, long before COVID, was treating any particular study like it is, uh, you know, the gospel or, or that it's quote unquote true. Um, you know, that's, that's where you get into trouble. But unfortunately, that's where journalists end up going, partly for no sort of new, through no fault of their own because of incentives and because of what we need to be doing to, you know, sort of get the news out to people. Um, but partly because of the way that the whole system set up in terms of incentives for scientists, which we don't have time for today, but certainly I think is something we need to look at as well. And I'll just leave you with this, um, again, in the interest of time, and excuse me, this is freely available online, uh, but a piece that I did for uh, CJR, Columbia Journalism Review, um, that ran back in the beginning of May, um, which really almost could be about covering any subject, but was really geared toward reporters who find themselves on orders. Uh, and so I have a number of tips and tricks that I've used over, the, over time, over my career of about 20 years uh, in journalism to try and at least put some context around this, put some of the put breaks on some of the findings that are going out there or on the reporting that's going out about those findings. Um, and so again, you're welcome to take a look at that. And I think that's my last slide, just uh, the usual contact info and acknowledgements and what have you. So thanks. And I look forward to the other presentations and to uh, questions um, uh, afterward. So I'll stop there and uh, hand it back to you, Shibisha. Thank you, Ivan. Um, so next is Alice. Alice, do you want to share your screen? Um, I think I will. Again. Yeah. Okay. 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 So just give me a minute here. 
Um, all right, so thanks so much for being here today. My name is Alice Fleerekers, and I'm a PhD student at Simon Fraser University in the Scholarly Communications Lab. Um, and I'm presenting some research on behalf of uh, myself and my co-authors, Michelle Riedlinger, Laura Moorhead, Ruxana Ahmed, and Juan Pablo Alperin. Um, so we are all obviously gathered here today because of this virus. We would not be doing this over Zoom, um, I'm guessing, if uh, the coronavirus hadn't changed our lives so dramatically. But in addition to changing sort of, sort of our daily lives as Ivan so beautifully set us up for, it's, it's really changed the nature of science. Um, so this is a chart from a preprint study um, that I believe was co-authored by Jessica, who's here today. Um, and it sort of just charts the massive growth of scholarly attention to um, the coronavirus in the research literature. But the part that I'm really, you know, interested in here is, is this surge in preprints. Now, I'm a, a researcher focusing on science communication, so how research is being publicly portrayed. Um, and so I was really interested in this part of the same study where um, the authors found that COVID-19 preprints were just getting so much more media coverage than uh, preprints about other topics normally do. And so we see this in news articles and blogs. Um, and we, I saw this in practice a lot while I was trying to keep up with the news as well. So this obviously can be good if it's getting, you know, as, as Ivan mentioned, you know, preprints are not necessarily that much worse than peer reviewed papers, but it can obviously have negative consequences if those preprints do end up being flawed. This is just an example, um, a press release that's giving some information about two preprints that linked COVID-19 prevention with nicotine. Um, and they got a quite a bit of negative, or they got quite a bit of media attention before um, the word got out that they were highly flawed, um, which obviously has negative implications for um, readers if those news lines were taken seriously. So all of this kind of got our team thinking, who in the in our online media landscape is actually covering preprints and, and how are they portraying the sort of inherent uncertainty that comes with this unverified or unpeer reviewed research. Um, very conveniently, our paper just came out last week. So if you want to know more, I'm just gonna be covering very broad um, findings. You can check it out here. I'll end with this slide as well. So for, uh, to kind of, get a better sense of what was going on in the preprint media coverage. We looked at uh, 100 of the most um, cited or most, um, the, the preprints that got the most media attention during the first four months of the pandemic. And using all metric data, we kind of captured all the different, more than 500 different mentions of those preprints in online media stories. Um, and then I sat down with another coder and read all of those uh, 450 plus stories really paying specific attention to how the preprint itself was being portrayed. Um, and what we found was that there was a huge diversity of outlets actually covering these preprints. It wasn't just sort of traditional outlets like the New York Times or the Guardian. It wasn't just, you know, sort of medical or science related outlets like Medscape or Inverse. It was all over the place. We saw places like um, MSN and Yahoo News, Wired, Business Insider, everybody um, seemed to be covering preprints in some way. Um, and what was interesting to me also is that there was a big range in terms of sort of the volume of stories across these 15 outlets that we ended up looking at with places like Medscape, which you know is, is arguably more interested in medical research, publishing fewer preprints than places like Yahoo News. Um, turning to sort of the way that the preprints were portrayed, we looked at four what we called framing devices or just sort of ways to emphasize the uncertain nature of the preprints. And those were sort of mentioning that the, the study in question had not been peer reviewed, um, sort of indicating that it needed to be verified or replicated by other scientists, uh, sort of explicitly stating that it was an early study, a pilot or preliminary in some way. And then finally, labeling it as a preprint. And looking across all of the stories and all of the different outlets we examined, we found that only about 
57% of the stories um, mentioning preprints used any of these devices to indicate that um, the preprint was uncertain. So in many cases, we just saw people saying things like, in a study published yesterday, or researchers have found, you know, there was, um, in almost half of the stories, there was no indication that this study in question hadn't been peer reviewed. And in some cases, it wasn't even clear that it was a study at all. It was just a random hyperlink supporting a claim. Um, and again, I think what's really interesting about this finding is kind of looking at the different, um, you know, reporting strategies across the different outlets. So I'm not so surprised that places like Medium, where anybody can write about anything they want with very little editorial control, they didn't use a lot of these sort of markers of uncertainty. They didn't really do a very good job of portraying the uncertain nature of preprints. Um, but was, what was really surprising to me was that places like The Conversation, which is largely academics writing about um, research, and The New York Times, which is a very well-established news outlet that does a lot of amazing science coverage, that even these places um, were very inconsistent to, in terms of the degree to which they use these sort of four strategies for conveying uncertainty. Um, we also looked at sort of, did any of the stories portray or describe what a preprint actually is? Because I realized most people, especially before this year, had no idea what people were talking about when they said preprint. And we found that about one in 10 or 10% 10 of those stories had some kind of definition and importantly, these were not always correct definitions. So just to give you a flavor of what this looks like before I wrap up, here are a couple of my favorite definitions of preprints. Uh, this quote says, Crammer's lab published the methods as a preprint, not peer reviewed, but available for people to try. And um, I think my personal favorite, the 21st century way to report to data almost in real time. So that was a lot very quickly. and. Just to end things off, I want to give a sense of what all of this might mean right now and maybe in the future. So on the kind of negative side, we have really a wild west of journalistic practices. As Ivan was saying, journalists have really had to speed up and many people who don't normally cover science are covering COVID research. And so we just see a huge variety in approaches. Um, this can result in audiences maybe not having all the context they need to make sound choices about their health and well being. And ultimately, it could result in evidence being misused or misinterpreted, not just by everyday people, but also by policymakers. Um, but on the positive side, science is reaching publics really quickly in a time where we really need um, to have information to make good decisions. Um, and looking back at sort of how preliminary health research has been portrayed in um, online news media about like other topics before COVID, we're actually seeing much more markers of uncertainty. The media are doing a better job than they have ever done based on previous literature in terms of conveying this uncertain research. And then finally, and I think Ivan hinted at this as well, there's sort of an opportunity to build literacy and understanding. You know, we only saw preprint definitions in 10% of articles, but 10% is already a lot more than what I would have expected to see, a, you know, one year ago. Um, so with that, um, I invite you to check out our paper if you want some more information. And we would love to hear your comments, your questions, your ideas. Um, thank you so much for your time. Great. Um, so, hi everyone. My name is Lisa. I work at the press office of KU Leuven, which is a large research university in Belgium. I just want to quickly share our policy with regards to preprints and the media, and then also give you two striking examples of things that happened last year. So, we think that preprint preprint services are a great channel for researchers, but maybe a bit less so for journalists. Um, this is especially so for smaller media landscapes uh, like ours in Belgium, where journalists are often not uh, specialized in scientific reporting, might not know what is in front of them, and we've all seen this uh, in this pandemic. The check by external researchers or experts that peer review entails is therefore quite a valuable step for us before going public, even 
if peer review has its flaws, as Ivan has touched upon, and we have to be wary of those flaws. But for us, it is a necessity before communicating about a study most of the time. There are some exceptions. For example, there are fields of research where a published paper is not the main or, or the only currency. And there are also those rare cases in which you need to move a bit faster for public health reasons. First, I want to show you what can happen if you don't plan your science communication carefully in pandemic times. You may all have heard um, that the 1.5 meters or six feet of physical distance may not be enough when you're running or cycling to stay safe. So a civil engineering professor at KU Leuven had shared uh, some models on this on Twitter to, to illustrate it. And it very quickly made international headlines. And journalists soon found out there wasn't a paper yet and there wasn't even a preprint. And then this happened. The conversation turned from being about uh, the study findings to one about the form in which the data was presented to the world. And quite interestingly, the press said it wasn't even a study, which it, it actually was, but it hadn't been turned into a paper, let alone a published one. I think this could all have been avoided had there been a paper with complete data and important nuances that science requires. And I would argue that even a preprint in this case would probably have been much better than just a simple illustration on Twitter. My second example is one of when, um, when we did decide to do a press release with only a preprint on hand. So at KU Live, we have a team that's working on a coronavirus vaccine based on the yellow fever vaccine. And this quickly reached the Belgian press and some international outlets as well. And we were getting a lot of questions about it. So in the early days of the pandemic, we had to be careful as at the time, there was no public data available on the vaccine candidate. So we finally decided to announce details of the vaccine candidate when the preprint with the data was finally published on BioArchive in July. But this was definitely a necessity for us that the data was at least available somewhere. One of the reasons for doing this was that we weren't going to stop the Belgian and international press from writing about the vaccine. And we also assumed that the preprint might be picked up by more journalists um, anyway when it was published online. So to offer additional context, we organized a briefing for press, uh, national and international, which we started with a huge disclaimer about the fact that we were discussing a preprint paper with findings that had not been yet peer reviewed. Again, especially important for our local press here in Belgium. Then the final paper was published in Nature in December, quite a bit later. There were no major revisions of the information in the preprint, but the team fine-tuned some experiments and mostly they added a lot more data in their final version. Um, we didn't want to really draw attention to what we in essence thought was old news, but at the same time, we wanted to share that the data had been published in the meantime. So this was quite a complica complicated situation and the first, first time we ever encountered this. Um, so in the end, we decided to publish an update article and we also sent this information to our contacts. In this second example, we were very much in control and prepared for any questions, but this isn't always the case. A single tweet or even a comment at a party can quickly make international headlines. We found that out the hard way. Also, not all researchers go via the press office, they often have their own contacts. And finally, we've seen reporters pick up studies directly from preprint servers, sometimes even without contacting the researchers behind it. I've especially noticed this um, with trade press, mostly medical. And the question is, what do you do then? So we feel that it is our duty to make sure that we are seen as a partner and not perceived as an office where people can order just press releases at will, which is unfortunately sometimes uh, still the case. It's quite an old fashioned view. We advise researchers on news value, timing, possible risks and so on. And we also keep an eye on COVID preprints as much as possible. And the same with preprints that may generate a lot of attention or buzz. So, and we have to just make sure that we are prepared when something leaks uh, before publication. In my personal opinion, I think something like a manifesto that both press offices and individual researchers would endorse could be very helpful in ensuring that we are all on the same page when it comes to the promotion of preprints. And I'm very happy to answer any questions or discuss further after uh, the meeting, um, or if you want to contact me here is my information. Thank you very much. 
that's lovely. Thank you. Um, we'll, we'll move on to Roberto. Okay, great. So uh, just as a note of introduction, I'm Roberto Buccione. My background is, is a research scientist for many years and then a, um, a scientific editor at Embo Press. And I'm currently uh, head of research development at San Rafael University in Milano and head of uh, responsible research innovation at the hospital, uh, San Rafaele Hospital in Milano, which of course they share the same uh, campus. So uh, I'm not going to go through this, it's just to give you an idea of the size of the hospital and the, 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 the patient traffic and services. And uh, so arguably this uh, San Rafaele complex is um, the most important uh, research hospital in Italy in terms of research output and, and uh, clinical achievements. And it's currently one of the top medical schools in, in Italy. It is also a private hospital and, and university, which is not really the norm. It might be the norm in the US for instance, but not necessarily uh, in many other countries, including Europe. And, and therefore we have our own marketing department. And of course, a press office and a brilliant team of science communicators. So everything was fine and dandy. And then uh, COVID happened. And this sort of shook our world and the world of everybody else's world. And I would like to remind you that our region in, 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 um, in, uh, in Lombardy was a dramatic hotspot for the early rise of infection in, in Italy, actually I would say in Europe. And our hospital performed admirably, admirably well, both in the clinical and in the university settings. But of course, we're not here to tell that story uh, today. Um, so I would just like to go through a number of issues that were pre-existing uh, and, 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 and other uh, things that we discovered along the way together with many other hospitals uh, in Italy and, and, and also outside of Italy. So uh, just to mention a few pre-existing issues. So, First of all, there's something we often don't talk about, and that's the com conflict between the uh, basic uncertainty of science knowledge and the need instead to provide to the general public uh, reassuring, at least reliable information. And we know that there's actually no proof, absolute proof of anything. Uh, and, and, and scientific knowledge is the result of experimentation. It's continuously challenged. And this, of course, is a healthy process. And save for rare exceptions, uh, perhaps, uh, research activities contribute to knowledge via incremental steps, which are normally formally communicated through peer-reviewed publications, but increasingly via alternative means. So I'm not going to elaborate on this here because the great talks that have preceded me and probably the ones that will follow me will uh, discuss this more directly. But the point is that we can only hope to achieve progressively more accurate approximations of the truth or to put it differently, lesser degrees of uncertainty. So why am I saying this to you know, a bunch of people that already know this, of course? It's because we sometimes don't explain this well enough to the general public. So crudely, we can only provide the best available information at a given time. And the COVID pandemic clearly exacerbated this eternal conflict. Also, I should mention that at least in Italy, and for instance, I know for certainly in Germany too, I think, and probably other countries, university professors enjoy an unlimited freedom to pursue their research interests, which is enshrined in the constitution, but this somewhat extends into communication. And typically in a research hospital such as ours or any other for that matter, most head physicians and permanent staff uh, will also be university professors of some sort. And so again, this will uh, undoubtedly ended up complicating uh, issues at some point. So there are also in general vulnerabilities and, and uh, we just heard, heard from the previous talk how important it is to have procedures in place. And so um, uh, there's a need for more guidance on who actually talks and when to talk and how, what and how to say, and this is not uh, uh, censorship. It's just trying to give a consistent, uh, uh, a reliable message. And so you need systems, procedures, and, 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 and COVID uh, sort of crashed, uh, cracked open uh, vulnerabilities uh, from this point of view. And, and, and of course, it wasn't just us. It, it was a general issue, I found, at least uh, in, in many research hospitals. And of course, um, communication tended to be person focused, not institutional. So egos come into play. And uh, of course, uh, this 
uh, the, the, the communication was potentially affected by personal scientific interests or school of thoughts, which in turn leads to obvious uh, scientific conflict of interest, whereby the person communicating wittingly or unwittingly pushed or was biased by interpretation that conformed to his or her own uh, personal convictions. So there's a number of issues here that were clearly vulnerabilities in the system. And then of course we had emergent problems. So uh, hospitals became de facto bona fide media outlets, which if you think of it is, is a bit crazy. It sort of subverts the normal flow of things. And, and this is a problem that I, that I, I, I clearly found to happen. And also of course the, the, the eternal balance between the freedom to communicate and the consistency of messages. And so the freedom to communicate is, is fine, but it's fundamentally messy. And the avoidance of contradictory messaging, or even to generate false hopes on unjustified fear, needed to be uh, 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 taken under control. Um, so this connects to the person. So a less than ideal communication, which connects to the personalized style, style of communication, uh, ended up showing that little space was dedicated to reiteration of key proven rules. So distancing, masks, hand washing, and all that sort of stuff wasn't repeated often enough. And finally, so did we at least learn that we need to listen to scientists? Uh, so we at least learned that we need to listen to scientists, but the point is, have we really, uh, is there really more trust in science now? I don't know, because some say that uh, People mostly trusted science anyway, but they did not have the tools to appreciate what was valid and what wasn't, assuming anybody knew. And COVID certainly didn't help in this regard. So uh, I just want to conclude with, by mentioning a few other issues that we need to improve upon. For instance, one is networking and coordination between authorities, institutions, hospitals, organizations, et cetera. Again, this was mentioned also by Elisa in passing. So future pandemic, emergency plans would need to include some sort of sync between different institutions. So when I mentioned personalistic type messaging, I forgot to mention that this extended to also the collective egos of institutions and hospitals in sort of an untold competition to show who was the most advanced, who was the most efficient, and who was the most heroic, et cetera, et cetera. And, and uh, another key issue is uh, the ability to clearly demarcate key actionable items from scientific information, which is important, but it's not necessarily actionable at a given time. And within scientific information, we also need to clear, clearly demarcate, and again, we heard about this already, the best available information, for instance, validated or confirmed or whatever, from hypothetical, from hypothesis, personal communication, preprints, and otherwise, uh, so-called non-validated communications, so to say. I, I, I don't want to open the Pandora vase here. It's just trying to convey a general message. And finally, consistency is key, uh, but this was completely neglected at the beginning with conflicting messages going all over the place. And we realized only, not we as a hospital, but general as a system, as the, the community, uh, we, this was completely neg neglected, if not much later and deeper into the uh, pandemic. So I will stop here. And of course, as the other speakers, I'm available for questions uh, later on. Thank you. That's great. Thank you, Roberto. Um, so next we have Shirley. Um, so hi, yeah, I'm Shirley decker -Lucky. I'm the content director at SSMN. And I thought for this webinar, it might be interesting for people to see a specific example of what one preprint server is doing as we're trying to balance our support of quickly sharing research while also doing screening and helping readers really know what it is they're looking at um, when they see a paper. And so we you know, have a process as many preprint servers do of taking the paper, doing a screening, doing um, a quality check at high level, and then adding some what I call cautionary language or um, something along those lines. SSRN is a um, large interdisciplinary preprint server. We've been around since the 90s. And you can see here just some stats. We've got a you know, decent size of content. We've got a lot of people coming to our site to download papers and, and use them in their research. And we've been growing a lot in the last few years in terms of the disciplines that we support. So you can see at top, there's that little um, diagram and it's showing in yellow, the kind of social sciences areas that we supported, and in green, 
humanities areas that we supported. And in the last few years, we've expanded it, which is the, the lower right-hand corner. Um, and we now support preprints in physical sciences and health sciences, applied sciences, life sciences, as well as adding a little bit more in social sciences and humanities. Um, and we do a very simple screening and classifying process for all of our content, where we're looking for completeness, relevance, determining whether it's scholarly. Um, we're also very broad at our platform, where we include preprints, but we also include other things like conference papers, working papers, um, you know, posters, and so forth. And we. Um, when we started to move into medicine, we realized that that simple process that might have worked well for economics papers obviously didn't work so well for medical papers. So when we started working with preprints with The Lancet and doing medical preprints, we um, added these addition, additional layers of screening. So we look for what we call the four elements, you know, which is looking to see our funding statements. Is there a conflict of interest? Is there ethics approval? Is there a clinical trial registration needed? And that's a prerequisite. We don't post a paper on our site if it's a clinical medical paper and does not have this um, in a satisfactory format. And then we do an additional screening where we're trying to confirm on a high level, is it scientific? Is it relevant? And kind of a core question for us is, you know, is it dangerous to human health if this is posted? Um, and we exclude some papers. So we definitely are erring on the side of caution. If there's a paper where we're not so sure, at this point, it's, you know, it's a preprint. We're not doing a full peer review or anything remotely like it. We don't want to be posting something that has the potential to be problematic. And so we, um, when our screener, who is a subject matter expert, determines this make the call, um, perhaps in consultation with other people on the team, um, and we do exclude things that you know, might talk of a definitive treatment, for instance, or that might make substantial claims and doesn't seem to be supporting those claims. We also add, as I said, what we call cautionary language. And we've got this in a couple of places because we, we recognize the need, particularly this came to our um, attention in medical content, that readers, journalists, and anybody reading the content on our site would need to, of course, have some indicators that this has not gone through a full peer review and should be treated with some you know, caution. So we add additional cautions for medical and COVID content, and you can see the language here um, that we use. We also um, add some cautionary language to the PDF. So we have a statement, this preprint research has not yet been peer reviewed uh, at the bottom of the, of the PDFs. And on preprints with the Lancet on their landing page, they've got this cautionary language that's specific to the Lancet. They also have on their paper abstract pages that same cautionary language and that cautionary language on the um, PDF at the end. So we're continuing to look for ways to help researchers know what it is they're looking at. We've grown quite a bit. We've been adding medical content with that associated additional screening. And in 2021, we're going to be looking to build on this. Uh, we recognize this is sort of a you know, new area trying for all of us on this call even to think about what's the best way to approach this. So for instance, um, we just hired, we just created a new position and hired a wonderful new medical content editor, some of you may know Claire Stone. Um, she's joining our team and will be helping us think again and in a fresh and robust way about these questions. Uh, we're adding a medical watermark, which is shown here, where we're going to have a clear watermark saying preprint not peer reviewed on all of our medical preprints. Um, we're engaging in community conversations just like this one. ASFIO does a wonderful job facilitating community conversations, coming up with guidelines and so forth. And, and that's very much a part of, of how we're trying to continue to evolve. And we're also kind of playing around with a badging idea. Um, and so this is just sort of some things that we're, we're playing with now about how might we provide better visual distinctions 
so that when someone comes, they can see more about what's actually happened to that paper, what level of screening has happened, what hasn't, and to make a, a clearer distinction between uh, the preprint and the version of record. So that's just a little bit about what we're doing here at SSRN to try to make it clear to people who read our content what it is that they're looking at. Thanks. Thank you, Shirley. Um, Emily, you're up next. Great. Okay. okay, so yes, I'm Emily Packer. I'm the Media Relations Manager at eLife. Um, I'm just doing a very quick talk about preprint reviews and the media today. Um, so just a quick overview of what we'll cover. Um, I'm going to just give a brief introduction to eLife, um, give an overview of preprints and the um, review preprint review services that are currently available um, to authors, and uh, uh, provide a quick look at benefits of preprint reviews for the media. And I also have um, a question to pose um, at the end. So just to give a quick intro to eLife, um, we're a non-profit organisation created by funders and led by researchers. Our mission is to help scientists accelerate discovery by operating a platform for research communication that recognises the most responsible um, behaviours in science. Um, so speaking of accelerating discovery, preprints. Um, so as we all know, yes, they have grown massively in popularity over recent years. Um, we had the explosion of COVID papers in 2020 and probably to continue. Um, and it demonstrated the, the important role that preprints pre can play in accelerating science and also presented an opportunity to bring peer review and curation to the growing preprint literature. Um, and, and why would we need peer review and um, peer review on preprints? Well, as we've noted, you know, preprints can have sort of varying, um, uh, that they can vary in quality. Um, and uh, last year, our editor-in-chief co-authored a piece in the New York Times, which I've just um, pointed you to here, um, talking about the need for scientists and journalists to establish a service to review preprints um, that are published ahead of formal peer review um, to sort of avoid potentially misleading and dangerous research uh, being widely covered ahead of time. So I'll come back to this shortly. Um, so eLife itself last year launched um, one service to peer review preprints and um, preprint review. Um, the idea was to help authors get the feedback they need quickly and efficiently while also providing context that other readers and potentially journalists might need when they're looking at the paper as well. Um, following that and, and following on from the, the ever growing popularity of preprints, we, we then took what um, our editor-in-chief called the logical next step and said that we are only going to start peer reviewing um, research published as preprints. And again, I've just pointed towards the editorial that we released about that. Um, but preprint review is a complementary service to other review services that are currently available to authors. So we know that we're not the only ones doing a similar thing. Um, ASAP Bio itself recently published a comparison review of other serv similar services, including preprint review, um, review commons, peer community in, and others as well. And so how, how can the media use preprint reviews? Um, well, as, as again, we've mentioned, you know, making new research available almost immediately conflicts with a traditional journal approach of um, giving journalists new findings under embargo. Um, it makes the research available available in real time. So essentially takes away that, that sort of having that breathing space to look at the research and, and really consider it ahead of covering it. Um, but they are they are on the rise and they're only growing in popularity. So posting reviews on them can be useful for readers to give them context and also for journalists who are looking at them for potential stories. It can give them um, you know more background information that they might need to, to sort of see where the research fits into the bigger picture. Um, reviews can also help determine if a preprint is worthy of press coverage that you know they might indicate that, the conclusions in the preprint are sound um, based on the, the data and the results presented, um, or they might indicate that further work is needed before the research can perhaps be reported on responsibly. Um, so they can again give that give that sort of indication as, as to as to where where um, where the research sits currently. Um, but either way, journalists you know who are looking at preprints for potential stories uh, are encouraged to contact third party experts for further insights. 
um, and that there are organizations like the Science Media Center um, to help connect with experts, as can perhaps the journal considering the work at the time. Um, and just something for uh, to consider. Um, uh, so building on Eli's preprint review service and also going back to the, the New York Times piece that was co-authored by our editor in chief, Michael Eisen, um, we've talked with Michael about um, potentially providing brief editorial assessments of preprints aimed specifically at journalists. So at the minute, preprint review is kind of aimed at, is mostly aimed at authors and readers to give authors the feedback they need and re um, readers the context they might be after. Uh, but we thought, you know, could we also add a kind of different assessment that's aimed specifically at journalists? So if a journalist is looking at a preprint, um, our, our editors, you know, could have posted a comment on there saying, yeah, this research is sound, you know, this, this is important to release to the public now, or they might leave a comment saying, no, that this, you know, th th this is not ready to be covered, this, this needs a lot more work. So it'd just be a very sort of um, concise, um, comment letting journalists know at a glance whether or not a preprint is worth pursuing for a potential story. Um, and again, then we could leave that comment. And then if a journalist is looking at the preprint, they could then get in touch and be connected with another expert or, or the same expert or another expert to provide more, more insight on that. Um, so it's something that we're currently considering um, and, and talking about. And yeah, we welcome any feedback on whether it might be a helpful approach for when reporting um on on preprints so um yeah that's that's all from me um thank you and that's it great thank you emily um, nick you're up next hey hi everyone um i'm going to actually leave my video off because i have a a, a number of other people in the house who are uh, using the internet bandwidth for various school and work obligations. So um, let me try and share my screen. I'm the uh, journals and open access director for uh, the MIT Press. I'm gonna talk a little bit today uh, about a new journal that we've started called Rapid Reviews COVID-19 with uh, our editorial partners at UC Berkeley and our technology partners at the Knowledge Futures Group. So uh, Rapid Reviews COVID-19 is an overlay journal uh, that reviews preprints on COVID-19 and publishes them openly. Um, it's primarily, but not exclusively, uh, preprints from public health, medical science, the biological and chemical sciences. Uh, we do uh, look for preprints in other areas, but it, it really has been dominated by those, those three areas so far. Um, as I'm sure everybody here is aware, there are well over 10,000 preprints uh, on MedArchive and BioArchive alone that are related to COVID-19. And uh, even though publishers have sped up their publishing processes related to COVID, it's still really not enough to be able to deal with the, the real tsunami of research that's out there. So as, as I'm sure many of you uh, would, uh, would have guessed already, the, the reason what we wanna do it is, is the reason uh, that we're really talking today is that there's a lot of unverified research out in the world, which is subject to manipulation for political and other reasons. And, and we really wanna do our best to try and debunk that bad science and elevate good science if we do find it that that good science is actually not finding a home. Um, we had the idea for the journal back in March of last year, and then we connected with UC Berkeley and their School of Public Health in April to be the editorial office and the former Dean, Steph Bertozzi, uh, agreed to step in as their editor-in-chief. Um, we connected with the McGovern Foundation in May to fund the journal, and then we used uh, June and July to really tweak the ideas and pull together the infrastructure required and started soliciting reviews beginning in June. The first reviews we published uh, were in August. We probably could have gotten some of them out earlier, but we wanted to wait till we had a critical mass. Um, as of January 8th this year, we've uh, reviewed 82 preprints and we've published 190 peer reviews and we have a further 73 peer reviews that are in the pipeline. Um, just the other day, I was talking with the editor in chief and he was suggesting that he'd like to get this up to 100 preprints reviewed every week, uh, which would be, uh, you know, 5,200 preprints a year and probably 10,000 peer reviews. That's probably beyond what we can reasonably expect, but if, if we could get this up to you know, 350 to 400 preprints and over a thousand reviews done every year, I think uh, we, we find ourselves in good stead. Um, we've 
it recently initiated some technology changes. So one thing we did is that we added these uh, status indicators for the reviews. And uh, there's a strength of evidence scale that goes from misleading all the way up to strong. So we wanted to give people uh, at a quick glance uh, a chance to see um, what the character of the review was. And hopefully that it was enticing for them to actually read the entire review. Um, the editor, the editorial office itself is working with a group at the Lawrence Livermore Labs in Berkeley. Uh, they have an artificial intelligence developed called COVID Scholar, which they're using to sift through the tens of thousands of preprints that are out there on COVID and try and find the ones that we feel would have the greatest impact. Um, and then finally, we've made some connections with the preprint servers themselves. Uh, they, they are now, uh, some of them are including bi-directional linking. So if you read a preprint that has a review that we've done, it will have a link over to that review on our site. Um, probably the, the biggest thing that we've done so far, at least the most high profile thing, are reviews that were done in relation to the Yon paper, which came out mid-September from scientists at a foundation that was partly funded by Steve Bannon. Uh, this alleges that coronavirus isn't naturally occurring and rather it appears to have been created in a lab in China. Uh, this has come up before, perhaps not with such force uh, and publicity as it has in this particular case. Jan herself uh, appeared on Fox News multiple times and, and literally millions of people have been exposed to the ideas via that platform and elsewhere, YouTube, Twitter, and so forth. So we felt it was really important uh, to get out reviews on this as quickly as we could. And we, we got four reviews up from several top researchers, including Bob Gallo, who was the uh, discoverer of HIV. Um, we were first out with the peer reviews of the study and uh, we also got a press release out very quickly. Um, and what was gratifying is that the Times uh, and other outlets really picked up on those reviews and started referencing them in their stories about the paper, which really felt uh, that we were living up to our part of our mission, which is to influence the public discourse on COVID. The biggest challenge that we have right now is, is ensuring that we can keep going. So um, again, the McGovern Foundation has been incredibly generous in their funding of the journal, but we need to figure out a sustainable business model that will carry us through and potentially adapt this uh, model to other kinds of challenges. We, we've talked a lot about doing rapid reviews, climate change, for example. Um, but you know, we, we really need to figure out how to make this work money-wise if uh, there's no subscription fees, no APCs and so forth. Okay, that's where I'm gonna stop. And I think I'm out of time anyway. Thank you, Nick. Um, we'll move straight on to Tom. All right, thanks everyone. I'm Tom Sheldon from the Science Media Center in London, where we're a charity set up to try to improve the accuracy of news reporting on controversial and headline subjects in science so that the stories told to the public are evidence-based and responsible. Um, so I'm going to try and talk very fast for five minutes about preprints in the media from a UK perspective and I'll finish with a quick presentation of a press release labelling system which is being widely used in the UK. So preprints are clearly good for science and have uh, certainly been an important part of the research response in the pandemic. But to uh, a lot of journalists covering daily science and health in mass media preprints are relatively new on the scene and until last year many hadn't come across MedArchive or BioArchive or any of the other main servers before, instead subsisting on a diet of peer-reviewed articles via press release from journals and universities. And most of the reporters I asked two years ago, and I, I should note um, everyone that when I talk about reporters, journalists in this talk, I'm very specifically talking about mass media uh, 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 daily health and science journalists uh, 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 writing articles each day for a, a, a general audience. And, I, and I, I polled a lot of them a couple of years ago and they, they overwhelmingly said that they weren't interested in un, un peer reviewed work, preferring to rely on journals to review and edit before covering them to give them signposting that they consider to be important. 2020 has disrupted this system, of course, and we don't know if this heralds a long term shift in reporting patterns, but we do need to be aware of the change in behavior across the media. And the COVID pandemic has meant that newsworthy research is being posted to preprint servers faster than ever, with some of it crucially important to public understanding and behavior. And where some of it simply can't and shouldn't wait for peer review before being publicized. Um, when there's new hard data about the current infection rate or something like that, then that will be out of date long before it's ever externally reviewed. And it's better in some of these cases that potentially imperfect data is communicated to a mass audience immediately, but, but there's all sort of 
all sorts of uh, 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 you know relative harm tests that you need to apply conscientiously at that time, and it's not always clear. Um, and and bringing stuff to a, a mass audience, um, you know, and feeling that that's necessary. That's that's certainly not true of all early stage work, and I, I think we've got to resist opportunism. There's there's research which can and should wait before it's presented to a global audience on COVID and every other subject. But we are seeing COVID preprints being brought to the attention of journalists much more often um, in the last 12 months, sometimes with good intent, but not always. And in a very small number of cases, journalists are going to preprint servers to find stories. So beyond the pandemic, will there be a lasting change to report, reporting patterns with preprints routinely publicized and journalists trawling the preprint servers for juicy stories. I don't know. I don't think anyone knows. I don't think journalists know. Um, I think from a medical and health standpoint, personally, I, I, I hope not. The potential to mislead the public, I think, is too great for three reasons. First, we lose peer review and the journal process of editing and acceptance. Far from perfect, as, as previous speakers have noted, but surely, surely better than no filter at all. I hope that's not a really naive thing to say, but it scares me that if we're uh, saying that peer review is um, uh, worthless. Second, each piece of research only gets one shot at publicity because that's just how the media works. Um, and if, uh, if research fed to the public turns out to be weak or fatally flawed, then that fact just won't be subsequently reported to the vast majority of people. Um, and third, publicizing a preprint to journalists deprives them of the embargo system, which I think is valuable, which allows them time for scrutiny and seeking third party expert comment which simply can't be applied to uh, something which is immediately out there. I still hear two arguments being made which I think are misleading and too often deployed somewhat dismissively by uh, people within the scientific community who, who, who are great ardent proponents of preprints. And uh, uh, one is illogical, I think, and the, the other is a bit naive. The first is that peer review isn't perfect. You get bad science in journals all the time, and I accept that completely that peer review isn't perfect. I don't think ever anyone ever said it was, but that's no argument for throwing all preliminary work straight at journalists and hoping for the best. And I think it's illogical to conclude that all early stage research is equally deserving of mass consumption. And the other argument is that it's just the responsibility of journalists. But the media doesn't work like that. If a preprint is publicized, we force the hands of journalists and make it very difficult for them to disregard the story. And we ignore the fact that the media are there to tell and sell stories, not to check science. The scientific community, I think, has a responsibility to the public to be much more sophisticated. So overall, I feel that the responsibility here lies very much with press officers and scientists and everyone involved in that chain to consider the harm that could be done by publicizing a preprint the minute it gets posted to a server. Journals need to give strong and clear guidance about publicity when they're part of that chain. Researchers shouldn't be looking for a mass public audience unless they have a good reason for doing so. Press officers should resist pushy academics who want their name in the papers. I think that's a very small minority, but they do exist. And they certainly shouldn't press release a preprint just to get a name check for their university, which we sometimes uh, uh, see, or I suspect that's the case. Where a COVID preprint does merit mass publicity, and I repeat that there are certainly many where a good case for that can be made, a very clear press release should be issued with everyone taking care to avoid hype, stress caveats and anticipate public impact. And I, I really should emphasize, having said all of that, that many of those people are already behaving very responsibly in all of these ways and I pay, pay tribute to all of them for doing everything that they can to make sure journalists are reliably informed at, at such a crucial time in public understanding and, um, uh, uh, and I'm very heartened to hear what some of the previous speakers just before me, Elisa and um, um, Emily and uh, Shirley said about the practices that they're implementing. That's, that's really encouraging. Okay, the organizers of this session have asked me to tell you about the press release labeling system, which I'll do now very briefly. In uh, 2017, the Academy of Medical Sciences in the UK produced a report about improving public understanding of evidence. And one recommendation was some form of traffic light system where press releases from universities and journals We'll be given some sort of kite mark or mark of quality to act as a signpost for journalists and the uh, science media was tasked with trying to implement this um, and we quickly realized two things of course first the traffic light system uh, just couldn't work as no one would ever give a red flag to their own press release 
And second, it had to be voluntary because it's not practical and possibly not ethical for anyone to police this system from the top. So it evolved into this labeling system, which is very simple. Press officers put three labels at the top of each press release. The first just says if it's peer reviewed or not. And the second indicates what kind of study it is um, uh, and perhaps what depth it goes to. And the third uh, says what kind of subject the study examined. It's used by um, many of the major health and medical journals and many of the biggest UK universities as well. Um, and most of those have said that it, it, it slots very neatly and, and comfortably into the, the, uh, their systems. It's easy, it's discreet, it gives journalists a very clear indication at a glance of what's being presented to them, but probably most importantly, it encourages press offices to make this information readily, readily available to so it supports the work of those press officers who are already being responsible and transparent in their press releases, and it puts pressure on those who weren't to be clear about the scope and power and rigor of the science that they're publicizing. And it makes it harder to hype research or make an observational study of five mice look like a rigorous controlled human trial. And here's what it looks like in practice. It's uh, possible that some form of this, I guess, could be adopted by uh, in, in, in the preprints world, um, I, I'm not convinced that simply stating in a news article that this is a preprint so hasn't been peer reviewed entirely tackles the problem. It's important to flag it, of course, but in the end, the story is still there being read by millions of people who aren't necessarily concerned with the finer points of the scientific publishing process. And, and, and Alan, by saying flagging preprints uh, in this way, although important, is, is no substitute for scientists and press officers behaving as responsibly as they can, stopping to think before uh, joining any kind of publicity gold rush every time they post a new preprint, whether that's on uh, COVID or anything else. I'll stop there. Thank you very much. That's great. Thank you, Tom. Um, you can stop. Sh you can stop sharing your screen. Um, um, I can see in the chat that there has been a lot of to and fro and discussion. Um, parallel parallel um, discussions happening but um and some of the early speakers have already answered questions posed to them but we have got time um to pause here to see whether anybody has any questions that they would like to put to um any of our speakers um Jessica, this is Theo Bloom from BMJ and uh, Med Archive, and I, and Tom will know because we've been on panels together before that I sort of wholeheartedly disagree with the idea that we need to protect the public from science um, and, and protect journalists from science uh, until it's been filtered by journals. Um, I, I'd be really interested in some kind, I don't know if we can do a poll, but I'd be really interested to know how many of the people on the call think there are only a few occasions where preprints are worth sharing more widely. And I suppose I, I, I would hold the counter argument that where we have medicine by press release with uh, companies or chief medical officers telling people uh, what they should prescribe or which vaccines they should give with what doses, I would much prefer a world where we have all the data available in the form of a preprint to have those discussions in a more informed way. But I'm, I'm really interested to know um, where others sit on that issue. Well, that, were you addressing that to Tom specifically, Theo? Or um, is this a general? I, I, I sort of am, but I know what he'll do. <laughs> knows what I'll say and I'll, I know what he says. I'm not sure how informative it is, but maybe others on the panel, you know, could, could respond to that. Um, this is Shirley, I could certainly chime in. Yes, Theo, I basically agree with you. I think there's a real benefit. And um, that's not to say that we don't have some, you know, efforts that we take to mitigate the risk and to do it wisely. And I think it's coming out, you know, in this conversation that there are things that um, that could be done or should be done, and there are probably more things that we need to do to make sure that people are understanding what they're getting. But I, I think personally, it would be a big step backwards to try to pull preprints back from the public. And, and frankly, I don't think it's possible at this point. I'd also like to comment, um, if I can. Um, I do agree that in an ideal world, 
that would be the case, but I wonder how you then think that um, press offices or journalists who don't have a scientific background in the field of the preprint should handle the preprint, how they should estimate its, its worth or its interestingness or its contribution to science and to the world. Um, many, many press offices have people in their team, including ours, who have a humanities background, who are writers, um, that's why I mentioned the partnership. Um, we do depend heavily on, um, on the researchers, which is definitely risky and, and sometimes a bit scary. Um, and I feel that if we opened the door to preprints, it would be a lot scarier even for us to, to venture into science communication about those two studies. There's a, there's a general question in the chat. Um, that's perhaps more relevant for practicing journalists, but do you think that the large amount of commenting on preprints in social media, especially Twitter, can be leveraged in a useful way to sort out the wheat from the chaff? Anybody would comment on that? Well, I, I commented on on that in, in the chat, but uh, uh -huh. I think it's I think it's already happening and uh, in in a good way. I mean, there are lots of news outlets that embed tweets uh, that uh, that are in fact, major news outlets do that routinely. So um, I think it's a good thing. I, I actually encourage my students when I'm teaching and, and you know, my staff, wherever, wherever I'm working. By, by the way, full disclosure, I guess, should have mentioned given that um, Alice uh, talked a lot about Medscape or in, in her uh, presentation that I ran Medscape's editorial until October. Um, but, uh, you know, we used to quote tweets all the time. So I, I think that, you know, that's a great, and again, you have to know what you're looking at and you have to dig into whether or not those Twitter, you know, Twitters, excuse me, those, those Twitters really know what they're talking about. But, um, you, you, you know, that, I think that's already happening. Any more questions? It's preprint review services. Are these going to be scalable? Who would like to tackle that one? Well, I am, I can chime in a little bit. I think um, for me, I'm, you know, I've, I've just started doing my first peer reviews as, um, as a student. And um, it's, it's interesting that this is such a core part of, of science and of research, but we're never taught how to do it. There's very little incentive or recognition for doing this work, even within the quote unquote normal peer review system. So. I guess I have a question about, you know, how how do we make this a sustainable and a rewarding practice and support the people who are doing it so that it is worth their time? Um, both, I guess, within peer review, but especially with something that's more even less recognized, like preprint review. Um, I'd like to chime in on that one too, if I could. Um, at Rapid Reviews COVID-19, the, the scalability question is, is huge for us. And, and frankly, we're uncertain whether or not this is going to be scalable. But I, I will say that we've had uh, a great deal of success in, in using almost a battalion of graduate students and postdocs to work on sifting through all the, um, all the preprints that are out there and then writing up uh, a small peer review of their own that they send up to the editor in chief. And then the editor in chief actually determines whether or not that should go out for peer review among experts. And this has actually been really terrific because it's given uh, these graduate students their, almost their first view into how the publishing process works. And it's given them contact with experts that they perhaps have not had contact before. Um, and uh, you know, from that perspective, I think it's been great. And I would also add the one, thing that the neatest thing that has come out of all this on our side is that UC Berkeley is actually developing a couple of classes around the experience that that we've uh, encountered or that we've gone through in creating rapid reviews and so graduate students and undergraduate students can get a sense of uh, what the publishing process is like so I, you know I think those are um, those are really good uh, examples of of how this is uh, that's a I think that's a, a, an example of how this might actually be scalable. I see that there is a question of whether they're paid for the labor. The answer is yes. Um, there are some volunteers, but the majority of the people who are putting in time on this uh, journal, including the students, are paid. 
That's a great point. And it just um, made me think back on uh, some research that our lab did right before the pandemic. So very different kind of scholarly ecosystem looking at the comments people were leaving on preprint servers. And they found this was research done by Mario Maliki, who was a visiting scholar at the Skullcom lab. And they found that actually a bunch of those comments had informal peer review reports in them, you know, like not just a one off critic critique, but really laying out the brief summary of the paper, compliment sandwich of here are the, the strong points, here are the negative points. And um, I thought that that was really encouraging in terms of this question about sustainability, because these were just open form comments. It wasn't COVID-19, so there wasn't this pressure to make sure that the public is being well informed. It was just people, scholars of their own sort of volition contributing to this conversation in, in the way that they knew how to do, which was the sort of a formal peer review in an informal context. So um, I'll put a, a link to that study in the chat if anybody is interested. Are there any more questions or comments? Yes, if I may, uh, just, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, go ahead. Oh, just 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 a, just a general comment. It, it kind of sometimes I find it vaguely mind-boggling in that. So it's like we reinventing peer review, peer review 2.0. Uh, preprints now are being sort of reviewed, and are we starting this all over again? Uh, I, I, you know, it, it's just sort of um, weird to me. So are we defeating? The purpose of preprints now that we are sort of devising mechanism to peer review them and so do they become then validated uh, so validation now is good because it's a sort of a different peer review style of preprints as opposed to official uh, formal peer review so I just you know trying to understand a little bit better because i'm sure many other people are a little bit confused by this especially traditionalists if you wish Does anybody want to comment on that? Yeah, I, I just think that's a really good point, Roberto. And I, I noticed um, Lisa Kinchcliffe put this in the chat too, but you know, how is it perhaps the same as a desk reject or, or you know, is there an overlap between what a desk reject would do and what some of these reviews are doing? Are we duplicating efforts? Is there a better way we could you know, capitalize on the review work that is done so that it serves multiple purposes. I think that's all really interesting to think about. Okay. Um, one last question, if there is one, otherwise we will move on. I don't think there's any, any more. So um, thank you speakers. Um, for your time and um, giving your talks and for um, answering questions. We are going to move on to the, the breakout session now. So um, I'm going to share my screen and speakers, you can um, switch your videos off um, if you want to. Okay, so What's going to happen next is um, we're going to break up into smaller groups. Um, and there are some special instructions that we've written for the groups, um, which will be dropped in the chat. If you are an odd number in an odd number group, um, we would like you to look at document A. And if you're in an even number group, we would like you to look at document B. Um, and the activity is going to be to um, summarize a preprint. Um, and if you want to tweet the summary that you've written using the preprints in the public eye hashtag. So if you were wondering why um, the breakout session asked you to, to um, tweet a summary of a preprint, um, it's because one group had very specific instructions about the information to include in their summary when the other group didn't. And the, I've just pulled these two out. I'm not sure whether the groups had finished writing them or, the, you know, or whether 
they were still working on them. But you can see here, this is the same study and um, the one where people were actually told what information to include, um, they, they, they included more information. So it's, it's clearer here that um, this is a preprint under consideration. And the whole point of this is just to illustrate that if people are actually thinking about the information that they should include in the communications about their research, it might actually improve um, the clarity of that communication. We will collate the other um, summaries and we'll feed back later on whether um, there's anything, you know, any new insights to report on that little um, breakout exercise. Okay, so I'm going to have to stop sharing. Okay, so um, just to end this meeting, um, I wanted to tell you about the, the preprints in the Public Eye project, which is ASAP Bio project, um, conducted with support from the Open Science Foundations. And what this project aimed to do was to bring together stakeholders from preprint servers, academic institutions, publishing, and journalism, um, with a view to producing some best practice guidelines across the board on reporting on research. And the breakout session activity is related to this because one of the recommendations that has come out of, of this project in, is that um, researchers consider following some kind of um, format when they um, talk about their research on social media. We have produced um, a document that collates all the, all the guidance that we've agreed on for preprint servers, researchers, institutions, um, and journalists in a document which you can find on the ASAP Bio website. And I would really like um, you know, to encourage you to go and have a look at that and provide some feedback for us, have a read, and you can comment on the document, it's a Google Doc, or you can email me with some feedback on that. That's all I'm going to say about this project. Um, I think all that's left is there. We've all, we've all had um, quite a long uh, session. So all I'm going to say now is thank you to everybody um, for taking part. Thank you to all the speakers for um, your talks and thank you for the people who participated in this meeting. I would show a final slide, but I just can't go through the process of sharing and unsharing my slides with you. So I'm going to just stop sharing um, and end the meeting there. Thank you, thank you everyone. Thank you, so thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, bye. 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 Thank you, bye.